Ready you guys are looking shopping. amazing. You guys are ready to go with some. Thank you. We look very good. Really we'll we'll spend some money on some plastic Hands stuff. Through. What's your favorite childhood Christmas movie? Well, it's got to be Home Alone. Home My Alone. favorite thing Home about Alone. Home Alone, though, is that it is so realistic. All of those scenes are incredibly possible. Absolutely. Yeah. No grown men yeah, certainly would never be able to attack. No, when he gets hit in the face with that yeah. paint can, yeah. no, absolutely would happen to every male adult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. when he, <laughs> and when he steps through the door, or through the window and stomps his feet on the Christmas ornaments. He would, of course. he would for sure continue oh, yeah, to keep yeah, walking. Keep walking yeah, on yeah. The ornaments. And when the blowtorch like blows his hair on fire, oh, or whatever, like he he definitely he just great. stay there the whole time. Yeah, eight or nine it. seconds of that is how yeah. you, is the yep. best way to deal with it. Yep. This is a, this is a throwback, and this is a song that made uh, Kevin famous. Yes, it made it made the claim. It's, okay, it's not throwback to like before your time. Those reindeer had a very shiny nose, and if you ever saw it, you would even say it glows. Like a light bulb! All of the other reindeer, reindeer, used to laugh and call him names. Like Pinocchio! They never let poor Rudolph, Rudolph, join in any reindeer game. Like Monopoly! Then one foggy Christmas Eve, what? Santa came to say, He did? Then all the reindeer loved him. And they shouted out with glee. Rudolph the red nosed reindeer, reindeer. Down in his story. <laughs> Austin, what are you doing, dude? Like, that's Austin, our campus pastor at St. Croix craziness. But uh, I didn't know, you know how you end that, like you'll go down in history. Uh, I didn't know there's multiple ways to end that. We didn't even show the, on the video. I always say like George Washington. I've heard that some people say Lincoln, which is just insane. And some people say like Columbus. I, any Columbus people at any of our campuses? That's crazy. Like Columbus was not a good person. No, I'm just saying. No, I'm just joking. Hey, good to be with you today. Uh, my name is Travis. I'm the pastor uh, at the T uh, campus. Uh, I want to share with you, we're, we're in a series called A Glimpse, where we're taking a glimpse into the Christmas story from different people, different characters in that story. I want to share with you a story from my life. Uh, when I get my kids ready for school, it is like completely out of control. I don't know if it's true for any of you as well. Like we get the kids ready and, and God's like, hey, you had five of them. That's what happens when you have five children. It's a, it's a little out of control. Uh, but I, we get up in the morning. We got to get, you know, their, their, their clothes on. They, they wear dirty clothes all the time. Like, what, don't you know by now to put on clean clothes? You know, we get their lunches packed. They go have breakfast. We hit, it's winter time, right? So winter's the worst getting your kids ready because you got to get boots on, hats on, coats on, gloves on. By the way, any parents spend half their life looking for one glove? Like one glove, like not two. I don't know how we don't lose two. It's just one glove. And sometimes I find like two right ones. How is there two right gloves and I can't find the left one? So we spend our entire, so mornings are just uh, insane at our house. And I feel like I'm always losing control. And this morning was one of those, like I just feel like I'm completely losing control of my kids. They're not listening to us. And I'm about ready to get out the door. I feel like I've done a really good job keeping it all together. And then my son says to me, he says, dad, you're wearing my stocking hat. Seems innocent enough, right? Like, dad, you're wearing my stocking hat. Uh, and I said, uh, no, I'm not wearing your stack stocking hat. And he's like, yes, you're wearing my stocking hat. Well, my kids, they got uh, these stocking hats playing flag football. They played flag football. They got these stocking hats. And I just took them from them because they fit my head. And if you think that's really mean, they have hair on their head. I'm bald. I could die if I go outside. Feel sorry for me. And so I just took it from, and my, my son's like, dad, that's my stocking hat. Give it back to me. It's mine. And I said, Nothing in this house is yours. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing in this house is yours. All mine. And my, my son says to me, he says, no. He's like, we got, those, uh, we got those stocking hats from flag football. We earned them. It is mine. Did I tell you I was about ready to lose control? Just a little bit. And so I'm just like, I am losing control of my household. So it is time to reassert my dominance. And so I said to my son, not the best moment of my life, I said, 
Oh, really? Oh, really? You earned this? Well, let me tell you a little thing. I paid $80 for you to do flag football, and they used the registration fee to buy your stocking hat. So I will wear this stocking hat or any stocking hat anywhere or whenever I want. And by the way, until you're 18 years old, you don't have any possessions. All your possessions are under my possessions. Got it? And I, I took the stocking hat, and I went out of that house, and I wore that thing all day long. Can I get up? some applause from a parent here? Like I reasserted my dominance. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, that's, that's funny, and it's also, that's so stupid. Oh, my goodness. So what am I doing? Like, literally, it is a stocking. We have like 50 of them. I'm not even joking. We have like 50 stocking hats. Why are we arguing over this? But the deal was I felt my control slipping over and over and over. And then it was, it was time for me to reassert my dominance, reassert control. Uh, that's what I call a control freak moment. Uh, at any of our campuses, raise your hand. Come on, be honest. If you've ever had a control freak moment before, you guys are lying. There's so many liars at church. It's unbelievable. People just don't want to admit it. Uh, when you have a control freak moment, uh, I would like to think that I am really like even keel, that I just kind of go with the flow. But honestly, when I look deep in my heart and in my soul, I love control. And I hate losing it. I love control and I hate losing it. Question for all of us, do you love control? Um, it might be with your kids. It might be at work. You like to control what's happening at work. It might be with your friends. You like to control your friend group. Or maybe it's your bank account. There's that money in there, and I like to control that money or your emotions. I don't like to feel too much. I like to control my emotions. Do you like to control things? And a deeper question, and one that we're going to explore today is, when you start to lose control, what do you do? When you start to lose control of any area, there's millions of these. When you start to lose control, what do you start to do? So today, uh, we're going to get a glimpse of the Christmas story through the eyes of a character in the story named Herod. Now, you've maybe heard of Herod, you maybe haven't, but Herod was the king of Judea at the time of Jesus' birth. Judea is just the territory in which Jesus was born in. He was the king of Judea, and history tells us that, he, that Herod was a very impressive person. He was a great leader, he was strong, he was a good administrator, he was a good architect. Herod was a very well put together person, but... Herod had control issues, like he was a control freak. Listen to what we hear about Herod, and this doesn't come from the Bible, this actually just comes from history. Uh, Herod married a woman named Miriam, and Miriam's family was the, was the rulers over Judea before Herod became king. And so when Herod married Miriam, and then he became the king of Judea, what did he give his family for the wedding gift? He killed them all. He killed the whole family in order that they would never get back control of the kingdom. So that's bad, right? A step further, uh, his wife Miriam, he started to doubt her allegiances later on in their marriage. And so he had her killed, her mother-in-law killed, and all of her children killed. And you thought I was bad with the whole hat incident. Like that's to a completely different level. Like Herod... He was a control freak king. Now, he used violent ways to keep control of his kingdom. Now, kingdom is kind of a weird word. Uh, Herod's kingdom, I just want to kind of define it as this. Herod's kingdom is just the place where he was in control. Like kingdom probably means more than that. But for today, uh, Herod's kingdom was just the place where he was in control. Like Judea, like he was in tr control of everything here. There he was the king. And if Herod, if his control was threatened, he would do anything to keep it. And that's the Christmas story we're going to look at. That's the story we're going to look at uh, today is we're going to look at something comes and threatens Herod. Something comes and threatens the control of Herod. And you know who it is? It's a little baby in a little manger 
named Jesus. Now, I want to bring it to us for just a second. Uh, You and I, we aren't kings, right? And we don't have kingdoms, but we all have places where we are in control. You got that? Well, you know, we... We're not kings, we don't have kingdoms, but we all have places where we are in control. It's like we have little kingdoms. We might not be kings, but we have little kingdoms. Think of the places where you are in control. Like you might be in control of employees. You might be a boss. You might have some employees. Uh, You might be in control of your kids. You're like, no one's ever in control of their kids. True. Uh, You might own a home, and so you control a quarter acre of real estate that that starter home is on. Uh, You might control the money in your bank account. Um, And even if you can't think of anything, if you're like, man, I I don't have any possessions. I don't have any employees. I don't have anyone that follows me. I'm not in control of anything. You are still in control of you. Even if you don't have anything, you are still in control of you. You're in control of your body, and you're in control of the decisions you make. We might not be kings, but we all have little kingdoms. So Herod, he's this control freak king. And he goes through all these measures to create, to keep his control. And as we look at this, you're going to see like, man, Herod, he's a control freak. He's crazy. But the truth is, I think we're going to see a little bit of us, a little bit of Herod in us. So let's hop into uh, the story. Um, Matthew, one of Jesus' disciples, he's the one that tells us uh, the story of Herod and the threat that Jesus was to his kingdom. It's from Matthew. Jesus. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the reign of King Herod. Kind of cool, like this, like this idea of like you, sometimes the Bible, like is the Bible accurate or not? Like, like we know from history that King Herod ruled during this time, which is kind of cool, isn't it? Like there's stuff in the Bible that's true in history as well. Side note, you don't have to even pay for that. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the reign of King Herod. About that time, Some wise men from the eastern land, the wise men, we three kings, arrived in Jerusalem asking. So they come to Jerusalem and they're asking this question, where is the newborn king of the Jews? That's the threat. Why is that a threat? Like, what, what, what's the big deal? Wise men, they're coming. Oh, what was the big deal? The, the wise men, they come to Jerusalem And they ask the people in Jerusalem and King Herod, they say, where is the new king of the Jews? Can you imagine Herod being like, wait, I'm the king of the Jews. I don't know about you, there's never two kings. There's only one king. And so if there's a newborn king that is going to take my rule, that is a threat to my kingdom. Jesus, Jesus was born and his, his birth was a threat to Herod. Now think of our kingdoms, the the places that we are in control. What are the threats to your kingdom? There's there's tons of them. Let me give you a a few examples. Maybe you have a new, talented, funny, better-looking coworker that joins your company, and they're a threat. You're like, ah, they're they're better than me. That's, That's a threat to my employment. Or maybe you have an unexpected event that ruins your whole day. You're a type A personality. You have the, when, you're, when you wake up to when you go to bed, you have the whole day planned and you have an unexpected event that ruins your day. It's a threat to your control over things. Or maybe you're having a great day. You're really happy, a lot of joy, and then you get a text. And that text is a threat to your control. It's, it's, it's threatening your happiness. There, there's millions of these. Where you, where you look at where you're in control, what are the threats to your control? Jesus was a threat to Herod's control. Now let's look at how Herod responds. Continue on with the story. Matthew says, uh, the, the, the wise men are saying this. The wise men said, We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. Herod was deeply disturbed. So the threat comes, and Herod is disturbed. Now, this word disturbed it, it is a little bit different than maybe what you think. It actually means to fear or to be anxious. 
So the threat comes to Herod's control, and his first thing is there's an unsettling feeling in his soul. You've felt this before, right? Your control gets threatened, and there's like this unsettling feeling. There's this like disturbed feeling in your gut. It's like whoa, something's wrong. Your shoulders start to tense. You get that pit in, the, just the pit in the center of your stomach, that anxious feeling when control, control is threatened. Almost every time, almost every time we feel like we're losing control, we get anxious. We feel that disturbing feeling in our gut. You know, Herod said, here's the newborn king of the Jews. He could have been joyful about that. He could have given thanksgiving about that, but he chose to be anxious instead. So there's a threat, and then we feel anxious And then let's go on with the story. Matthew says, "Uh, King Herod called a meeting of all the leading priests and teachers of the religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men. He got them in a room, private meeting, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. So that I can go and worship him too. The threat comes. You have the feeling of anxiousness. And so what does he do next? Manipulation. He tries to manipulate the disciples. He doesn't want to worship the king. This king is a threat to him. And so it's like, I got to try to do some things to get back control. I got I to gotta manipulate the situation to get back control. Now, manipulation, we think of that as a really bad term, and it, and it can be. Manipulation can be terrible. Manipulation just really means a skillful way to regain control. Manipulation is just a skillful way to regain control. And we humans, like seriously, we are master manipulators, masterful at this. As I've been preparing for this message, I can't believe how much I try to manipulate situation. What does manipulation look like? It looks like telling little white lies about someone so that other people don't like that person. So you can kind of control what people think about this person. Manipulation looks like people pleasing. Now, I'm a people pleaser. I'm sure a lot of you are as well. I think I'm a people pleaser just because I'm nice. No, people pleasing is manipulation. We're manipulating what everyone else thinks. It's not, they can't have thoughts for their own. They can't think things about me that I don't like. So I got to manipulate everybody else to make sure that they like me, to keep the peace. People pleasing is manipulation. Another manipulation, this will hit home for those of you that are married, the silent treatment. Husbands, don't elbow your wives, just leave it alone. But the silent treatment is just like, I'm not going to talk to you until you apologize. I'm not going to talk to you until you make it right. Forget about like, having good conversation. I'm going to use this silence as a way to manipulate. Man, we could go on forever talking about the ways we manipulate. But manipulation is just a skillful way to gain control. And we all do it a lot. So Herod, he's got the threat. He feels anxious. He starts manipulating. Let's see what's next in the story. Matthew tells us, when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route. So the, the, the wise men, they went to Bethlehem. They saw Jesus. They gave Jesus' gifts. And then they decided to go by another route because God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. When manipulation doesn't work, Herod moves to anger. Kind of interesting. Anxiety, anxiety happens when we feel a threat to our control, right? We feel like our control is threatened, so we get anxious. Manipulation or anger happens when we can't regain it. 
So anxiety, man, I feel a threat to my control. I'm going to try to get it back, and I get angry when I can't get control back. Herod tries to manipulate the wise men to regain control, and when it doesn't work, he gets angry. I'd like to say that we're more mature than Herod, but I don't think we are. And I have a great example of this. Uh, this past week, uh, we were, uh, our, the T campus, we took our youth to 57th Street for kind of a worship, a worship night, and we took a bus over here. And on the way home, um, I got on the bus, and there was a kid, a middle school kid standing up, and we were about ready to take off. I said, hey, will you take a seat? And he said, I can't hear you. I said, hey, you need to sit down. Oh, what? I can't hear you. <laughs> wasn't doing very well at this point. And so uh, I said, hey, you need to sit down. He said, no, my seat's dirty. I'll just stand. I'll just stay standing. I mean, I went back and forth 10 times trying to get him to stand. Guess what? The whole ride from 57th Street all the way to T, he stood the entire way, wouldn't sit down. So after the 10th time, I just turned and faced the front and just fumed with anger just so angry. Now, he should have listened to me, right? I'm not trying to say, like, you should be disrespectful. He should have listened to me. But here, that's not the point. The point is, why was I angry? Because I lost control. Why was I angry? Because I lost control. I was trying to spin the plates. I was trying to manipulate them. Hey, we do this. We do this. Come on. Sit down. Blah, blah, blah. I was trying everything. He wouldn't sit down. I would lost control. I couldn't gain it back. And so I couldn't gain it back unless being something, doing something very illegal. I couldn't gain it back. And so I just got angry. You've felt this before, right? When you've lost control, you can't get it back. And so you move to anger. That's what Herod did. He tried to manipulate the wise men, couldn't get control back, and so he moved to anger. Now, here's the scary thing about anger. It doesn't always end there. When anger is full bloom, we see the next part of the story. Matthew says, Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him, so he sent soldiers. Don't miss the weight of this. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod lost control. He moved from anxiety to manipulation to anger. And all that was left was force. Anxiety, manipulation, anger, all that was left is force. And don't miss this. Herod literally uses his soldiers, grown men, to murder children, to gain control. Now, now force, like, it, it can be something really drastic like this, but force, really what it means is we use all of our resources to get control back. Whatever we have, we're just going to use it all to get control back. You know, manipulation, it's this sort of skillful way to get control back. Force, brute strength. I'm just going to do whatever I need to do to get control back. And force, I mean, it can be physical, right? It can also be verbal. It can also be emotional, we can use force in a lot of ways, but what force is, it's like, I'm just going to use everything that I have to get control back. Force is, it's like getting so frustrated that you punch a wall. Done it. And embarrassed that I've done it. It's screaming at your children. Done it. How about this? It's being so fed up with your job. Some of you have thought this. You've never done it. You write a scathing email and you just walk out and quit. Just using force, like brute force. I'm just done. I'm using all my resources to get uh, what I want. It's being so emotionally spent in your marriage that you're just done. You go to a lawyer, you file papers. You're like, yep, done. I'm just going to use force just to get out of it. Or, and this is devastating, it's being so frustrated with someone that you would physically abuse them, that you would hit them, that you would tackle them, that you would do something terrible to regain dominance, to regain control. Force is our last ditch effort to gain control. It is ugly and it is devastating. It's throwing all of our resources, everything we have, at a problem 
to protect our kingdoms. So that's Herod's story. That's the Christmas story from Herod's point of view. Merry Christmas, everyone. That's beautiful, isn't it? Happy, <laughs> Merry Christmas. Like, you're like, my goodness, I didn't know I was going to be so depressed on Christmas. It gets a little better. So. But I hope you see this. I hope you see the progression of Herod's control issues. We got a threat. Then there's the anxious feeling that we move to manipulation. Then there's anger. And then there's force. I hope you see that progression. See that in your own lives. And some of us, we might hop all around. Some of us maybe sit in anxiousness and manipulation a lot. We move back and forth. Some of us just sit in anger. Man, we're just angry all the time, but we've never actually moved to being doing anything too forceful. But, but wherever you're at, can you see that in your life? I mean, I'm, I'm just being honest. Like, like, I didn't know. Like, I just started studying this passage a few weeks ago. I had no clue this was in here. And I'm like, that is my life. I see that in my life when my control is being threatened. So the question is, how do we keep ourselves from these destructive steps? I mean, this this stuff, it ruins our lives, it ruins our families, and it ruins our communities. How do we keep ourselves from these uh, destructive steps? Well, this is the crazy thing about this story. This is the crazy thing about Christmas. Uh, Jesus was a threat to Herod's control, right? Jesus was a threat to Herod's control, but Jesus is not a threat to our control. Jesus is not a threat to our control issues. Jesus is the answer to them. If Herod could have got that. Jesus is not a threat to our control. He is the answer to our control issues. Now, how? Like, That's great. Like, how is Jesus the answer to our control issues? And this is the most important thing I'm going to say. So write it down, put it in your head, whatever whatever you have to do. This is the most important thing. Jesus, uh, Christmas, he flips the script. We have an idea of what a kingdom, what it looks like to be in control. And Jesus flips the script. And Jesus says, I haven't come to help you control your kingdom. I've invited you into mine. Listen to that. I haven't come. Jesus has not come to help us control our kingdoms. He has not helped. He's not like trying to enter your life. Let me get better control. I have not come to help you take control of your kingdom. I have come to invite you into mine. Do you see the difference? We spend all of our time in anxiety, manipulation, anger, using force, living to control other people, to control our surroundings, to control our lives, to control our little kingdoms. But Jesus has come to say, you don't have a kingdom. And you're not in control. You don't have a kingdom. And you are not in control. Kings, they control kingdoms, but Jesus comes and he says, I'm the king of kings. I am the king over Herod's kingdom. Isn't it crazy? This little baby came to Judea, Bethlehem, and the baby would be the king over the kings. Amen? Like he was the king over the kings, and he's the king over our kingdoms as well. Anything that we're trying to control, he is the king over the kings. Jesus' invitation at Christmas is stop controlling your kingdoms, stop building your kingdoms, and come join mine, because I'm the king of the kingdoms. And the truth is, all the building, all the controlling, we do it our kingdoms it will fall and it will crumble but the king of kings lasts forever he lasts forever so Jesus' invitation is relax let go I need this I'm just telling this song this preaching to me Relax, let go. You don't have control, it's an illusion. And you don't have a kingdom to build because I'm building it. Relax, let go. I'm just telling you, I need this so bad today. I don't know if you need it as bad as I do. I need to know that I'm not in control. And I just want to fall under the good king, the king who loves me and cares about me. I want to follow him and not build my own. When we build our kingdoms, the foundation of those kingdoms are 
anxiety, restlessness, insecurity, manipulation, force, aggression, arrogance. Man, just look at your life. Look at the lives around you. That, that's, the, that's the foundation when we build our own kingdoms. But Jesus' kingdom is different. It's founded on humility. Literally, God came to earth as a baby. Why didn't God come as God? Why didn't he come full with force? He came as a baby, humility. Jesus' kingdom is founded on trust. The whole time he's on earth, the whole time, he's like, God, I trust you. I'm following you. Me and the Father are one. I'm trusting God. It's built on trust. His, his kingdom is built on love. Jesus literally wept over the cities that didn't follow God. He said, God, I weep over the city. I wish that they would know you. It's built on love. His kingdom is built on forgiveness. When Jesus is on the cross, none of us do this. He's on the cross. The people that are driving the stakes in the hand, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And his kingdom is built on service. I mean, so often you look at Herod, it was like the people serve Herod. Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. Which kingdom do you want? Which kingdom do you want? The one built on anxiety, anger, force, or the one built on love, joy, and forgiveness? Which kingdom do you want? That's the invitation at Christmas time. Crazy enough, Herod would die about three years later. Three years later, he would die. He'd pass his kingdom on to his sons. He had four sons. They took four parts of the kingdom. And about the uh, year AD 60, uh, it all crumbled. His whole kingdom fell. But guess what? Jesus is continuing. 2,000 years counting. It continues. Through, if you look at the history, it's insane. If you look at all the kingdoms that have risen and fallen in the last 2,000 years, his remains forever. Church, our kingdoms are going to fall. They're going to crumble. The control that we have, it's an illusion. Jesus's will last till the end of the time. And our invitation at Christmas is just to be invited into it. Relax. Let go. Follow this king who is so worth it. Jesus has not come to help us control our kingdoms. He's invited us into his. Let's pray. God, thank you for this. This scripture, I don't even know how to apply it to my life. I don't know how to stop manipulating. I don't know how to stop being angry. <laughs> I don't know how to stop some of that stuff. And it's just being, I guess, reminded of it and asking your Holy Spirit to come in and change me and to change us. Would you do that? Would you come in and just start to change us and just submit to you? And I'm not saying we've we got stuff to do. You have things for us to do. And we need to stand up for people and all that sort of stuff. But man, it's not our kingdom. We pray more than we manipulate. We love more than we lead with anger. Help us as a church, help me just to submit to you. Amen.